started joining me is Diane Timmering, who is Vice President of Spirituality. Diane, welcome. One of the messages sure. we find Thank you in so much. What, uh, thanks, Diane. Glad to have you. One of the consistent messages we find in research and literature is the need for leaders to have courage and perseverance. Um, can you get started this afternoon by telling us some of about some of your experience with this whole idea of courage or perseverance? What situation? Show your story. Um, well, again, it's lovely to be with everyone, and and uh, here we are with the Department of Spirituality. We've, we've come far uh, as a team, and we've built together the largest for-profit spirituality division in the nation. Um, but something like that does not happen overnight, and something like that does not happen without the power of courage and no fear and, and pushing through. So I guess that really the earliest genesis, Jen, was Joe and I wanted, um, we wanted a department, we weren't a pillar at the time, but we wanted a department that where spirituality could be accessed by all of our folks, not just the residents, but also our family members, our stakeholders, our frontline team. So we really, that was sort of the initial vision. The other piece that I realized early on is that it needed to be real. It needed, we had a fiery, I would say, you, you really need a fiery vision of purpose. And that's definitely what we had, and that's something that, that we, we cultivated early. And you've got to have the passion for it. But you also have to have certain tenets around it. For example, I knew it needed to be real. I knew it needed to be interfaith. But it did not need to be watered down. If someone who was Orthodox Jewish or um, of a, you know, a free will Baptist, they got to embrace who they were in their faith tradition. So it was building it around, uh, it was building it around that, uh, the power of um, really embracing the essence of the divine within and not having to leave the spiritual skin at the door. But with that, you know, it's their faith model, so it's, it also was a model where it could not be, um, you know, there was no converting. Now, someone trying to get you to, 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 to feel or be or be another, a certain, another faith tradition. So these early tenets were very, very important um, in developing that. The other component was unconditional love, you know, the power of respect, the power of love, and love means that you want someone up close or from afar. You may not agree with every component of them and what their faith tradition might be, but you can certainly have the power of that unconditional love. And Jen, I'll tell you, the early tenets and nuggets were really the, are the foundation. So you've got to have a good foundation and a good fiery vision of purpose. But then, once you have vision, you know what do you do with it. You want me to talk about that? Well, and, and talk about it too. Some of the barriers. So, so I hear the strong uh, conviction. You really have to know what you want and that vision. I like the fiery part of it as well. So, as you are starting to try to implement, what were some of the barriers that you had to overcome that really took that courage? Yeah, great question. So, so what happened? I, I started going in. We were about 55 facilities at the time, and I started traveling Kentucky and Tennessee and going in and selling this vision. Right. I, it was, it was really a paradigm shift in the way I was proposing a paradigm shift in how care was delivered because it was clinical, it was therapy, but it was also that spiritual component. So I would go in and work with the administrators and talk to department heads and try to sell this vision. But I realized as I was on the road, I also needed, I needed more than just a vision, I needed a tool set, right? I needed a process owner. And so the vision of the chaplain manifested. And it, this is this is the tr a true story. So, encourage is around an opportunity. So you have to take an opportunity, whether it's a good or bad opportunity. You want to take it. So, I was at a facility in Lexington, and there was a department head who was very severely, just so sad. And I'm aware of it. And we had an encounter later that afternoon, and she told me that she had planned on committing suicide, taking her life that night. And so. Well, the good news is, is that one of the, an NP and the administrator and I were able to get her the help she needed that night and actually had her admitted into a hospital that evening. Um, I thought to myself, well, that's just a week, 
for two weeks. What do we do afterwards? So I actually called John Harrison, our CFO, and I said, John, I have a situation here and I would really like you to help me to test pilot a chaplain, part-time chaplain at this facility and that way we can not only meet the needs of the other stakeholders, but we can help nourish this desperately sad, precious woman to sort of emotional, spiritual help. And John said yes. And I had already talked to Joe about it. And that is the beginning of, that was the opportunity. And I didn't shy away from it. It was a really tough situation. And what that started, um, you know, that really started the part-time chaplain pilot. Uh, other, so that, that was very powerful. But once you get to chaplain in, you know, in the building, then you would have a system around it. I love what Deming and Drucker say, you know, those, those great business frameworks about you need an appreciation for a system. So Jesse had to, we had to start understanding the language of healthcare. I needed not just a vision at this point, I needed systemic cross driven opportunities for Jesse to have good counters with, with the stakeholders, to partner with clinical, to possibly care plan an inter intervention. Um, my opposition really came from my my intent in many, my vision. The other thing I'll tell you, team, is that when you have a vision, you can't back down from it. If you know how you're going to get something into the end zone, I knew I needed a full-time chaplain army. But a full-time chaplain in every facility is what? It's an FEE. So, well, I got a first couple of, you know, huge wins and, and we started piloting the chaplain program. We started to need, I mean, we're a for-profit company, so there would be an outcome component to it, right? that putting that framework around it and putting some evidence-based modeling around it started to show some of the regional support and some of the regional RVPs that it did have in on retention or impact on 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 you know the physical outcome of, of the resident if you pray over a pressure sore or even the psychosocial right depression anxiety some of those those other deleterious things that that we but there was a lot of, you know, there was an incredible amount of opposition, and I had, you know, it was, it was um, and the other thing is opposition, though, I will tell you, the opposition by these are by the RVPs, which I totally understand, because here I'm asking for an R, you know, an FTE, it was like the best thing, Jen, that happened. It forced me, I guess, to build frameworks and to learn the language of long-term care, because in doing that, I was able to build the frameworks, build the modeling, start to develop what my team needed to be to be successful in the facility and have the greatest outcomes with clinical, with therapy, with social services. So I just say embracing opposition um, with your heart. I mean, you know, I would go in. The other thing is, is that you got to be fearless. I remember I've been a consultant my whole life, and I went into the, uh, the facilities. And of course, I had God on my side, so if he's with you, right, he could be against you. But I would go in, and I knew there was opposition, whether it was on regional level or even at the facility level. It's not that anybody pushed her, you know, it, 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 it was just a change. It was, ch this is ch with change management, right? So you're going to get this natural opposition, which, you know, again, opposition, there is good opposition, and this was good opposition. But I remember walking into a facility, Jen, one time and saying, this is a tough sell, and I'm going to push hard, God, and I have no fear. But it's my job today. Make sure you have a job for me tomorrow. <laughs> so it was that kind of, now, I'm not advocating that for anyone, but that's just sort of this crazy mentality I had, you knowing what we were doing, what, what, what this thing we were building, you know, Joe and John and what we were beginning to build really was going to be powerful. I just had such conviction of heart. So I think, see, when you have that conviction of heart, you know that you can cross the threshold and have no fear because it's the right thing. And it will take root, right? It will kindle. Great, thanks. I'm hearing all sorts of recommendations, uh, Diane. First of all, great story, and you know that having to have conviction, don't shy away from um, uh, obstacles. Um, uh, in, in fact, embrace them um, because 
it will lead to change, it will lead to people really hearing you, listening to you. Uh, I think there's a lot of elements of innovation in your story as well. Any last thoughts or recommendations? To the, um, to the audience in terms of other things is if, if, they, if they're looking to step out or step up uh, with some courage. Any other recommendations? Uh, I would say that I would say a lot of mistakes. And I definitely screwed up and I definitely pushed people. Um, I lacked collaboration in the beginning. I really thought I had a strange thought, you know, that I, as a self, as a self-employed consultant my whole life, I just, you know, I just, I drive things into the end zone, and so I didn't understand the power of collaboration. But model would not work without collaboration. I understand the power of a good leader who's willing to say, "I am so sorry," you made a mistake there, or "I'm sorry if I offended you." You. That was gold for me, and I, you know, obviously I meant it from the heart. I was willing to pivot, willing to change things up. I was willing to sculpt my approach and my tone in the early days. Um, I had a moment, I mean, I had a moment probably a year and a half into this, I thought, it's just too hard, and I am so done, right? I mean, we all get there. And the Lord said, no, 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 I mean, no. And I would tell you, team, that had I, you know, decision not to, you know, keep going after that first kind of tough 18 months. I never worked in a corporate environment. So, you know, I mean, it was it was all a new experience for me. And had I, this, uh, the outcome and the product and the invention, the invention of our spirituality pillar would not probably exist in the capacity it exists because, you know, God, you know, God chooses you for great things, right? And so, Got to you. What is life without a journey and an adventure? And it has been like the best adventure of my life. And oh, that's great. Corky and Missy, two of the people who are also speaking, they're brilliant leaders, and they were early supporters of the program. And that's you know, that again, that collaboration piece, that early support was critical to the success. I'll tell you I'll, I'll, on the invention, on the innovation. I'll close with this. We are an invention. We have innovation in that we are trying, we are activating spirituality in the process as a team. Praying over pressure source. We're planning scripture language into the care plan for the psychosocial, delirium, dementia, said pressure source, um, you know, any kind of brokenness, whether it's physical or spiritual. That is an and innovation that is a formal care plan that does not exist in the world today. So, you know, that's where we are, and that will impact outcomes and impact cost containment. That impacts the new bundled pay models we're seeing come out of Washington because of the cost containment piece. So this thing is, you know, now it's just sort of it's this illusion of opportunity, um, and, and we're doing it together. So we are truly uh, an invention of the, of the heart. But tactical? And actual life. And we're, we're a collision of opportunities. Thank you again so much for sharing your story. A lot of uh, key points I've, uh, I've written down, I know, as, as I've been listening. And as you mentioned, we've got a couple other speakers. So let me turn it over to Victoria. And Victoria is going to stop speak with, with Missy Allen. Good afternoon, everyone. So glad you could join us. Already hearing some great stories around courage, perseverance, and in event, and now we're going to turn to our wonderful CEO of Riverview, Miss Missy Allen. So great to have you on today, Missy. Thank you so much. It's my honor to be here. Now, I know that throughout your career, you've probably had a lot of moments where you showed courage, perseverance, innovation. But I think we have a story that you're going to share with us today where you kind of see all of that come to light. And at the time, how about you just take it away with your story? Okay. Uh, I, uh, last week when I started thinking about this, I was like, there are so many uh, stories that I could probably tell, but probably our most recent journey uh, leading up to some of the things we've been able to do in the past uh, year, past two years are probably uh, the most interesting to folks, I guess, if it would be, uh, if folks find these put interesting. I, and I want to preface everything I say 
say uh, just two points. One, I consider my job a ministry. And secondly, I feel like I have arguably the best team surrounding me, from plant ops to quality of life to dietary to nursing and all in between. I don't think any CEO can do a job without having good people around them, folks who are always willing, always thinking uh, of things uh, for us to do. Uh, and I guess I would back up a few years. When we first started our journey with the Eden Alternative, uh, we were all excited we were going to do it all now. Run quickly, you can't do that. <laughs> so we backed up and started looking at uh, what do we need to do first, uh, you know, starting with training and continual training being the key. And I always ask my folks, heaven forbid, you had to come to Riverview because of an accident, a stroke, whatever, things happen. Would you, would you, Going to Karen Leah, if you can't say yes to that, then what do we need to do to change that so that you would be able to say, yeah, that wouldn't be too bad. I think I could do that. I think I would enjoy that. So that started us on our journey of really looking at what kind of unique creative things can we do. Our building is almost 40 years old. So we have to get creative with the space we have. Um, I've been long-term care since 1984. All has changed, <laughs> you know, uh, since 1984. We didn't have this technology. We didn't have Wi-Fi. Uh, we didn't have laptops. I'm aging myself. But <laughs> we can see how much things changed and, and grown. And, and even in the past five years, the past ten years, just stop and think, how much has changed in our own lives with the technology piece alone? So how much more is it going to change over the next five, ten years? And what do we need to do to position ourselves in our market to be able to care for those folks that will be needing our services? So we started we we started looking at that and that's one reason I love the Eden journey because it is the journey. I, I told our folks this place will be growing and changing and thriving when I'm dead and gone because it's because we as people are always growing and changing. There's so much that is happening every day. So as we started looking at again the technology, um, we're seeing more and more folks come to our uh, our home that have uh, you know their laptops, have their iPads. And all these things, and I was so thankful to our IT department because they helped me as we started looking at Mugsy Cafe. I started out with an, you know, I wanted to do an internet cafe thing, and um, and we just started looking at what would our elders want, you know, what can we do to for our community. We have our neighborhoods, so as we look at our community, and then even the greater community, you know, out in the community to bring those people in, to see that long-term care is changing, to try to erase that stigma that's out there that a nursing home is a place you go to die. I think it's a place you go to live. There and every go. day be the most awesome day it can be, no matter what, uh, where you are in life. You are you know, here for short-term rehab. If you're here for, you know, uh, for the remainder of your life, because that's where you want to be. If it's in life care, whatever it is, let each day be the most meaningful day it can be. And that's part of our goal. So when we looked at Mugsy Cafe, and we named him, of course, after our our, uh, our home's dog, Mugsy, um, we started looking at Internet access. And then tying that in, because we have elders here that are not tech and letting a therapy department work with them to teach them social media. We have several now that come into the cafe and will get online and watch YouTube or uh, uh, email friends or get on Facebook or, or any of those types of things. So that on Mugsy Cafe really came uh, to be. And, we're, and of course, we 
Uh, we will never turn an elder away if they don't have any money. We'll make sure that they get what they want to eat or whatever. But uh, we are using all the bene- uh, all the proceeds that we make from the sales that we have in there uh, goes to our resident uh, our elder activity fund. So for our trips that we go on in our rural segment, um, that you know we'll use them for that. We used it Christmas, just whatever it's needed for our quality of life programming. And I will tell you that. We have done very well. Um, our our trip is already paid for thanks to Muggsy Cafe. Congratulations! Um, yeah, we really—it's really actually kind of shocked me <laughs> to be honest. We probably um, we probably have gross sales of probably between two and three thousand dollars a month easy. And and, and, the- and the other piece of that is. Our community has gotten involved, and they come into the cafe. We do take orders now because we do a special <laughs> every day. We're doing, and we're doing deliveries. So <laughs> last Friday was a better day. We made about $700 on Friday. So, you know, that's not bad. We have mugsy T-shirts and mugs. and uh, So uh, we have a little cottage industry going with the Mugsy Cafe. At the same time, Back into community. Our elders love coming in, coming with their family, get a cup of coffee, a cupcake, um, or whatever, and just sit and enjoy um, time um, time together. So the cafe has really been um, been one of the things that we've done through our eating journey. Uh, we've added to that uh, year. We were able to open a library. And, uh, it's the Fred Harris Memorial Library. One of the advantages I probably have, again, it's rural community. I grew up here. I went to Preston's High School. Uh, I am now taking care of uh, family members of, of uh, people that I graduated with. And uh, one of the ladies that I went to high school with, her dad was here. She is now the head librarian at the local college. And she wanted to help us have a library. And I I apologize, I don't have pictures of it, but it's phenomenal. Um, we have, uh, she's got, uh, you know, thing catalog. You can go online and look at what books we have available. And uh, you can go to our website, RiverViewHealthCareCenter.com, and we have our own icon for the library. And, uh, it has been also a huge success. Um, I'm a member of the Chamber of Commerce, so um, it helps us a lot with getting positive um, out to the community of all the things going on, you know, with the Muggsy Cafe, with the library, um, and and it gives people a different uh, slot, if you will, on what long-term care really is. It's not a place you go to die. It's a place you go to live. So quick, very quick question in the couple of minutes that we have left for this segment. You've shared a great, great story. And um, we saw the pictures on the screen. It looked beautiful. The cupcakes looked yummy, by the way. Uh, y'all. <laughs> very quick question. Just what were the one to two barriers that you faced in trying to get this cafe started to help share with those um, who are listening that are facing similar opportunities, but they need to know what it took to overcome? So I would say... I, I, Joe Steyer once told me, uh, you uh, you treat your budget and then you do what you need to do with the rest. And there's kindly some truth to that. You know, we have an obligation to, you know, as CEOs who work within our budget, the budget that we're given. I always try to meet or exceed budget. Some I do better than I have some months than others. But working within your budget, you know, look at what you've got to do. And understand that you may not be able to do it overnight. I will tell you, it probably took me at least three months to Bugsy Cafe going simply because I did it all off the bottom line. I am blessed to have a phenomenal plant ops director. Don Cole can build or do anything. I told him what I wanted to do. He came in two hours later with paint chips and, and the flooring and had it done within a week. It just came down to us um, looking at places like um, Hobby and Walmart and buying a few pieces, you know, I don't, I, there's really not that much in. He built the countertop where you saw the cupcakes. Donnie built all of that. 
Um, he built the partitions and everything for our, we have two um, uh, computers in there. He built all of that. Um, so, you know, just, just emailing, for lack of a better way of saying it, and taking your time and having a plan and understanding that it might get done yesterday, You've got a plan, and you're moving toward that plan, and you're and you're still working within your budget, and you you get it done. That has worked for us in the library and with Mugsy Cafe, and actually Mugsy Cafe helped us do the library. <laughs> well, it sounds like you had some great teamwork there, um, which was you know, a blessing to get this going, and you had great um, opportunities to work with the community to get the results that you were looking for. So all around win, it sounds like. And we are so appreciative for you sharing that story. Uh, we do have one more speaker that is going to share a story of courage, perseverance, and innovation, like Diane and Missy has already given us. So I'll turn it back over to Jen to introduce our last speaker. Thanks, Toria. Um, I'm pleased to introduce you to uh, Corey Rod. Rodman. She has been with Signature for a very long time, is very well known, and she right now is working on special projects. So, Corky, talk to us a little bit about some of your thoughts, I know, just in general about this whole idea of courage and, and perseverance and how that really impacts us as leaders. We might have an issue with the... Um, we go here on on uh, with Corky. So let me uh, let me go back to our panel of um, Missy and uh, and with Diane. And and one of the questions I had for you, Missy, was what have you noticed with the that the, the the impact of your perseverance and your own courage? What's the impact on your staff? How, there as a result of kind of being that example of a courageous, uh, um, persistent leader. I get, we all help each other to be, you know, they are great sounding boards and give us great ideas. And I think when a, um, when our stakeholders see us doing these things, and especially as we're on our Eden journey, I've had several, uh, I had a, a CNA come to me last week we were training session together, and he had an idea. And um, he thought it for a few minutes. He said, well, now, Missy, I'm not sure if that would work or not. But I said, well, you know, let, but let's, you know, you don't throw the bee out with the bathwater, so to speak. Let's, you know, let's wait and let's talk it through. We'll, you know, we'll get a quality process going. So I think, to answer your question, it, it helps people to see that, to open, you know, I guess to open their eyes and to, and to start looking at, at well, we can do these things, you know. Let's let's all think together and work together, and um, it just makes. I've seen that it, it makes folks more open uh, mm -hmm. to ideas. Uh, mm -hmm. But you definitely have to have buy-in. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, so your your courage, your persistence, really helps others, inspires others to come up with their own ideas. So that innovation piece comes in there as well, and it um, it continues to grow. So that's great. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. Diane, one of the things you mentioned, um, if I can jump over to you, one of the things that you had mentioned, you said um, early on you, you figured out that you needed more of a tool set, and you, you, know, you described your, really your chaplains as being your tool set. What other tools did you feel like you needed? What frameworks, uh, if any, models did you use to really help catapult your ideas forward? Sure, that's a great, um, that's a great question. I wanted to say, Real quick, on one thought to what she was saying about having the budget to do something. The department, I had no, there were no budgets for chaplains in the early days. So really creating the valuation around the capacity of the chaplain and what we were able to do operationally, um, you know, that's where, why we are where we are today. And, you know, and, the, and so, and I love, like, Muggsy's Cafe has so much value. It obviously brings in some the financial side, but there's so much dollar velocity to it. It's community. Just really applaud you, Missy, and, and that vision. I, again, sometimes you can do things. You can start something with the seed of a, of a mustard seed, and, and then sort of the budget sort of evolves. So valuation evolves both directly and indirectly. So thought there. Um, Tools uh, on on the chaplains. 
of the kid. Is that what you asked me, Jen? I'm sorry, I got so. Yeah, if there, if there were um, other frameworks that you use, but yes, I am going to yes. hold on that question because I've got Corky back, and I want to make sure I've got time to hear Corky's sure. story and some yes, of her yes. thoughts on sorry, yes. Is that okay sorry. if we jump back to Corky? Um, Thank you. Corky, me welcome. Well, it's amazing. I turned to the phone to talk, and it was a dial tone. It, the speaker phone, it was a dial tone. I'm like, oh my gosh, is this a technical nightmare or what? But I had the courage to dial back in. <laughs> yeah, great. Thank you. So, Corky, I know you have many thoughts on this whole idea of courage, perseverance, and so forth. Share some of your thoughts on, on really what it takes for a leader to be courageous and really to persevere. Well, you know, it, it, we know that working as a long-term care administrator or really any any discipline in long-term care is, is a, a very uh, daunting task sometimes, as much as we love our residents. Uh, we know that there are uh, opportunities for things to go wrong, and uh, I, I just feel like perseverance is the ability to navigate through those hard times. And uh, I always like to kind of practice the thing like the duck, you know, stay uh, calm on the top and be paddling like heck underneath. And so I've just kind of done that. But one of the things that I think is really important when you're working as an administrator or any other discipline is to have some extra things going on, which, you know, kind of brings us to the innovation piece. Um, and I guess maybe I have a couple of innovation stories, but um, I guess the one that makes me smile the most is Learning Center here. Um, I just had this, this crazy vision in the middle of the night one night. The villa building here had... Um, a giant space that was totally underutilized, and I just I just woke up in the night and I'm like, oh my gosh, what if we turned that into a learning center and it could serve all the buildings in Memphis? We could come together and 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 uh, we could do orientation, we could do learning sessions, we could do all these things. And I ran it past a couple of people, and it was like, yeah, it seems like kind of a good idea. Well, it next week there was the CEO. Of um, school in um, Louisville. So I thought, okay, I'm going to be really courageous and I'm going to run this idea by Joe. And so I cornered him and I only had like five minutes. You know how busy those schools are. And I shared the idea with him and I don't, I kind of don't know what I was expecting, but I wasn't expecting roll out in 90 days. My message is, um, don't be afraid to ask, and and did, and we rolled it out in 90 days. But the thing that was the most beautiful about it was how it brought everybody together. Um, we didn't have a budget um, when we talked a little bit, about, but there was no budget. So we rolled it out in 90 days, so we started tearing down walls. And um, our maintenance men, the maintenance Make people from the villa, the maintenance people from the center of Memphis building, work day and night to make it happen. And we have this beautiful learning center here that's been used for a variety of different events, including the board meeting for Signature that just took place a couple of weeks ago. And we're going to use it next week for a, a quality of life retreat. And it's just opened up all kinds of doors for us here in Memphis. That's great. That's a great story. Um, having been a part of that, I, I can tell you that was an exciting time for a number of us as well. So we really have, have uh, enjoyed it. So we've seen some of the results of that. You, you talked about just right off the bat, don't be afraid to ask. Um, the, the power of that ask, as we heard a lot about in our last Learn Fest. So once you made that ask, once you made the commitment to go forward, what have you seen as some of the results of your vision of this learning center? Well, for, I mean, it's really obvious, like we're not crammed in a little corner for doing things anymore. We have a lot of space. We have real learning space. We actually have a classroom with uh, a man in it, and, you know, where we can teach trait care. And I mean, it really is almost like a school up there. Uh, we did get some, some state-of-the-art equipment, and uh, we have a beautiful kitchen 
that brought us together for a, a lot of different events. We actually cook up there together and have have small sessions together. Um, staff, um, kinds of um, want to reward employees. We bring them to the learning center. We bring them into the kitchen. We do things with them and for them. Um, it's just it's just opened up a whole multitude of opportunities. Here. I like that, and I heard the same thing from uh, Misty as well. And I think from Diane, in that you know, one thing, one drop in the in the in the water tends to have these rippling effects. So, like Muggsy's Cafe uh, led to the library, and you're talking about you know it was learning, and yet now it's gotten bigger, and then did some these other things that you can do for the community and for your staff. So that those are great examples. Thanks. What other suggestions, Corky, do you have when you think about uh, maybe administrators who are struggling with either taking, um, getting that courage or they're, they're struggling with a particular challenge? What other suggestions do you have them to build, uh, for them to build their courage and to uh, build their perseverance? Well, I think you just have to find ways to keep passionate about your job. Sometimes that's hard because sometimes we just get so overwhelmed with the daily tasks, with with the emails that, that one more email that comes and says you have another project, and and it's really easy to get just inundated with just just things to do. And I just think when you get to that corner when you feel like that, then you need to get up and go out of your office and go be with the residents for a while, kind of get yourself re-centered so that we remind ourselves why we're here, why we do what we do. A big thing for me has always been to get involved with the quality of life department. And I don't mean stand in the door and watch what's going on. I mean get involved with what's going on with quality of life. Um, that department is very small. They have a daunting job of, of, of trying to meet the needs of 100 or 140 or 20 or however many people you have in your building, and it's impossible for them to do it alone. It really takes all of us to become mini quality of life leaders to help with that. That's one of the things that will lift you up faster than anything, being involved, you know, wearing that shirt, wearing that hat, dancing that dance, you know, playing that drum, doing whatever it takes. Amazing what it does for your spirit, and it really gives you enough courage to go back into your office and the next project that you have to do. Great, great ideas. This this whole session has been. I'm just taking notes like crazy here. All sorts of uh, good ideas to to help us um, build our courage, build our build our perseverance, and then and, and as a result, really be innovative. So um, let me. Um, um, open the uh, lines to uh, for questions. Um, I uh, still want to tell folks that, um, how they can ask questions. I've got a few that I will ask the panel, but if we also want to open it for Q and A at this point, that will work too. Sure. If you go to the top of your screen, over to the right hand side, there's going to be an icon that says chat. If you take your mouse and click on the icon, it becomes blue. And right underneath where you had seen earlier the images of Diane and Missy, you're going to see a box that opens up, and it's going to say Send To. Right underneath that Send To, it's going to have an open field, and I'm going to type in the word Hello Now to you all, and you will see that developer. And then you can go ahead and just click the Send button, and that's where the um, questions will appear. I will read them aloud, and then we'll go ahead and get them answered. If you could um, maybe put the person's name before the question, so if the question is posed to Diane or Missy or Corky specifically, please make sure that you include their names so that we know who to direct the question at. Thanks, Sarah. And I'm going to go back to you with my previous question. Thanks for your patience. Um, and my question was, um, you had talked about your chaplains being a tool set, that you needed a tool set to make your vision come true. But I'm wondering if there were other frameworks or other models that also helped you take it from a vision to reality. Yeah, that's a great question. And I would say I definitely embraced the Cotter model. And I honestly, I, I learned about the Cotter model, the eight-step process for leading change. After I started, you know, developing the vision, you know, and started 
you know, think to build the framework around what its actual spirituality department would look like. But the lead change and those eight steps are really important and really powerful. So CARB definitely. I love Deming, D-E-M-I-N-G. I'm spelling, I mean, you know it, Jen, just spelling it for the audience in case they don't know. He's got 14 points. Um, but I love, I think it's point number eight, no fear. Uh, I just, just no fear. And let me go back just real quick, too, on that no fear. And as you said, Jen, and, and Cork, you referenced this as well, when we did Spirit, Spirit Fest, which we were so honored to do that with you all, it was about around the power of the ask. People ask. And the worst thing that can happen is a no. And, there, and I got no's for sure, but I just sort of pivoted and dodged and, you know, went another direction so I could get a yes. So, you know, there's a tenacity involved to it as well. So I just, I'm so glad Corky said that. And I'm so glad you referenced that, Jan, about the, 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 the power of the ass. But I think that goes to Deming's point about no fear. The model I used was Drucker. I mean, I, I think they were, they were sort of, they were a societal, um, frame of, you know, a, what are we, theorists with you all around the same time in the mid-1950s, and Drucker, uh, one framework, it was managed by objective. And going to the, one of those first CEO schools in the early days really, really helped definitely out of the whole department into its, its, you can have an idea, and you can have a vision, and you can do, you know, all these things, but it's like if you don't build the scaffold, it just can't exist. And it, the bigger we got and the more lives we tried to, ch to change and the more partnerships we tried to build with clinical therapy, I would my team down, and I have the best team, by the way, on the planet these today, and I love you guys, many of you are on. You, you let them down because they can't operate. They do what some of our vision, our vision was without that scaffolding. So I would say management by objective, direct for sure, Deming, Again, no fear, very powerful, and Cotter, just to name three. And I like that idea of building upon a structure or a foundation. So thanks for sharing that. Cora, I want to bounce back over to you. Um, you had shared a story with me uh, about your daughter and how she really helped you get through a very disappointing or a, a time that was that really struggling. And I know we all have those. We can almost, you know, like almost with altering type of disappointments or things that are going well or things that we're really struggling with. So how do you pick yourself up by the bootstraps and just keep going? Oh, goodness, I know you're talking about uh, what for everybody that's out there. Uh, I guess the biggest um, curry venture was when I made the decision to change facilities after 12 years. And uh, I love my facility. I love my team. I loved everything. Uh, there was a situation here at the villa where we, they lost their administrator. I had previous history here. Um, it just seemed like the thing to do. I had just precepted uh, Cora, my DON, and she was ready to, to sail and take a facility of her own. And so I made the decision uh, to to come over here to the villa, and uh, thinking it was a lateral move. And at this point in my career, I was going to be good with that. And it wasn't uh, three months later I found myself in the midst of um, an IJ survey that was probably the most difficult situation that I think I've ever been in. I, it was I was like in a foreign land. I, I mean, I just, I, it was like, oh, my gosh, what, what, what have I done? <laughs> How did I get here? <laughs> it was like you, you just want to run. It was like not one IJ. It was like 13. It was like uh, it, I, I, would, I didn't know if I could press on. I mean, it was just like I just don't know. And it actually, it was my daughter that just had a, a, a real, um, she had a real sit down with me, and she said, "Mom, whatever you do, you do not let this situation define who you are. You know who you are. You know what you've done, and pick yourself up and get going again. And sometimes you just have to do that. Sometimes you just have to pick yourself up and say, get going again. And that's exactly what I did. And and, um, and it really did help, and you never you never know who might give you that little push back into courage, or who might give you that word of encouragement. It may be somebody at work. 
uh, maybe somebody, you know, maybe your family, maybe whoever, but uh, it, for me, it, it was my daughter, and that was kind of a, a defining moment that I needed to uh, pick myself up and get going again. And this shall pass. You, you said that, that this too shall pass, and things will get better again, and they did, and they have. And, and thanks for sharing that story. Um, I, uh, what really stuck out for me um, is that it's, you, you just never know sometimes who's going to help you pick yourself up and move on. And it can come in, uh, in, in you know, whether it's your, whether it's your daughter or whether maybe it's a, a, a stakeholder, maybe it's somebody on the, um, the street or somebody in your community that can pick you up. So if you, if you feel like you're struggling to pick yourself up, there's others out there, always others out there to help you with that. One of the questions that we have for uh, Missy was, how did you get the cafe started? Was it a group idea or was it something that you uh, came up with on your own? Uh, I had wanted to have, I just had this idea of an internet cafe. And we, as with all of our things, we all got together and just started talking about, well, what would that entail? What would it mean to have a cafe, you know, an internet cafe? How can we expand on that? And then we start talking about, well, coffee, and then what are we going to name it? Our dog's name's Muggsy, Coffee Mug, Muggsy, and, you know, name it Muggsy Cafe. And, um, and it was a group effort. Honestly, it was a group effort. Uh, knowing that we wanted to tie social media and, and having that available to our elders as of that, having a place for our folks to go and shop, uh, you know, for our elders that can't go out to the store to give them some independence, uh, to be able to go in and buy their own items, their toiletry items, their food items, um, or if they go in and get on YouTube and listen to Randley. We have a gentleman that loves Ralph Sandley. <laughs> oh, so, um, that's kind of how we did it. Well, my question uh, on that is what is your delivery radius for these cafes? How far would you go right to now, a right now we've gone out about five miles. <laughs> oh, shucks. I think we're a little bit further <laughs> here in Louisville than five miles out. Oh, sorry. Thanks so much. Yeah, we, the local school is outside town, uh, Crescent's Burger Grade School, and, and, and it was worth the trip uh, because they, we were getting orders for Muggsy Burgers. We do Muggsy Burgers on Friday, and we're taking as high as 30 orders at oh. $1 a piece. we oh. all day. So. Wonderful. Diane, I have a question for you, and I think we're just about ready to wrap up. So one last question. That, uh, what are some ideas that you can provide for increasing engagement of stakeholders? Increase stakeholders? Mm -hmm. I, I think one of the biggest things I saw when I was new to long-term care is the, um, I think there's a simplicity to it and a beauty to it about the power of listening and the power of being present. I'm, I'm, on, I'm guilty of it. I mean, I'm moving at such a fast pace, I forget people. And I was coming in from a meeting I had downtown this morning, and this woman sitting having lunch um, on the picnic table in the home office by herself. Stopped, and I stood, and I waved to her. And we had an, a great encounter. And that, the power of being present, the power of listening, even the power of a silent, swishing prayer over someone, um, you just don't know how that buoys someone, and that does empower up engagement, too, because it's the part of caring, and, um, and that's what we don't do enough. Also, Jen, I would say, is real honest feedback, the critical conversation. We don't do honest, caring, good feedback enough, I think, and I think those couple, and I think those are some of the Q12 that we see on the gallop, but I think those are things that I see that are, are, are it's, that kind of some of that just communication piece can drive engagement to a whole level, a new level of heart to heart, the heart to connection. Great. So very much. This has just been so, uh, I know, eye-opening for me, lots of new ideas, tons of notes, tons of bullet points that I've written down for myself, and I uh, will definitely share those in our wrap-up this afternoon. Um, as we close here, I want to encourage anybody who is listening to join us at the Best Practices Expo. So take some of these best practices and just build upon them. We have um, individuals from Quality of Life, 
from the compassion from individuals to talk about retention, safety, um, engagement, all sorts of different ideas out there. MDS, please go out, join in the fun, uh, get involved if you're um, there. Uh, don't just be a lurker, get involved, participate, share some of your ideas, and uh, chat with those that are stopping as well. So thank you again to the panel. Super ideas, and we look forward to seeing you all at the Best Practices Expo. Bye now. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.